Now, I'm sure that most of you know the old story about the astronaut who went far out into space and was asked on his return whether he had been to heaven and seen God. And he said, yes. And so they said to him, well, what about God? And he said, she is black. And although this is a very well-known and well-worn story, it is very profound. Because, I tell you, I knew a monk who started out in life as pretty much of an agnostic or an atheist. And then he began to read Henri Bergson, the French philosopher who proclaimed the vital force, the élan vital, and uh, so on. And the more he read into this kind of philosophy, the more he saw that these people were really talking about God. And I've read a great deal of theological reasoning about the existence of God. And they all start out on this line. If you are intelligent and reasonable, you cannot be the product of a mechanical and meaningless universe. Figs do not grow on thistles. Grapes do not grow on thorns. And therefore, you, as an expression of the universe, as an aperture through which the universe is observing itself, cannot be a mere fluke. Because if this world peoples, as a tree brings forth fruit, then the universe itself, the energy which underlies it, what it's all about, the ground of being, as Paul Tillich called it, must be intelligent. Now, when you come to that conclusion, you must be very careful, because you may make an unwarranted jump. Namely, the jump to the conclusion that that intelligence, that marvelous designing power which produces all this, is the biblical God. Be careful. Because that God, contrary to his own commandments, is fashioned in the graven image of a paternal, authoritarian, beneficent tyrant of the ancient Near East. And uh, it's very easy to fall into that trap because it's all prepared, institutionalized in the Roman Catholic Church, in the synagogue, in the Protestant churches, all there ready for you to accept. And by the pressure of uh, social consensus and so on and so on, it is very natural to assume that when somebody uses the word God, it is that father figure which is intended. Because even Jesus used the analogy, the father, for his experience of God. He had to. There was no other one available to him in his culture. But nowadays, we are in rebellion against the image of the authoritarian father. Especially this should happen in the United States where it happens that we are a republic and not a monarchy. And if you as a loyal citizen of this country think that a republic is the best form of government, you can hardly believe that the universe is a monarchy. But to reject the paternalistic image of God as an idol is not necessarily to be an atheist. Although I have advocated something called atheism in the name of God. That is to say, uh, an experience, a contact, a relationship with God, that is to say, with the ground of your being, that 
does not have to be embodied or expressed in any specific image. Now, theologians on the whole don't like that idea. Because I find in my discourse with them that they want to be a little bit hard-nosed about the nature of God. They want to say that God has indeed a very specific nature. Ethical monotheism means that the governing power of this universe has some extremely definite opinions and rules to which our minds and acts must be conformed. And if you don't watch out, you'll go against the fundamental grain of the universe and be punished. In some way, old-fashionedly, you will burn in the fires of hell forever. More modern-fashionedly, you will fail to be an authentic person. It's another way of talking about it. <laughs> but there is this feeling, you see, that there is authority behind the world, and it's not you. It's something else. Like we say, that's something else that's far out. <laughs> and therefore, this Jewish, Christian, and indeed Muslim approach makes a lot of people feel rather strange, estranged from the root and ground of being. There are a lot of people who never grow up and are always in awe of an image of grandfather. Now, I'm a grandfather. I have five grandchildren, and so I'm no longer in awe of grandfathers. <laughs> I know I'm just as stupid as my own grandfathers were, and uh, therefore I'm not about to bow down to an image of God with a long white beard. Now, naturally, of course, we intelligent people don't believe in that kind of a God, not really. I mean, we think that God is spirit, that God is uh, very undefinable and infinite and all that kind of thing. But nevertheless, the images of God are far more, have a far more powerful effect upon our emotions than our ideas. And when people read the Bible, and sing hymns, ancient of days who sittest throned in glory, immortal, invisible, God only wise, in light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. They still got that fellow up there with a beard on. It's way in the back of the emotions. And so we should think, first of all, in contrary imagery, and the contrary imagery is, she's black. Imagine instead of God the Father, God the Mother. And imagine that this is not a luminous being, blazing with light, but an unfathomable darkness, such as is portrayed in Hindu mythology by Kali, K-A-L-I, the Great Mother.